Well, hey, Gospel City, hope you're doing good on this Monday. I wanted to just follow up after uh, the sermon that we looked at yesterday. If you remember, if you weren't at church, maybe you're getting this encouragement and update, but I just was sharing yesterday from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, which talk about uh, not walking as the unregenerate world outside of Christ, but putting off the old self and renewing our minds and putting on the new self. And, you know, my heart was burdened last week uh, in my own life. I was convicted. And then I'm thinking of so many people that I know who are experiencing that tension and that struggle between what the flesh desires and what the spirit has placed in our hearts, what we know honors God. And that's a real struggle. It, it's something that so many people are are um, facing. And I've even gotten a lot of response over the last 24 hours after looking at that passage of just people saying, you know, I felt like you were talking right to me. Uh, man, that was convicting. Man, the Lord's doing this in my life. And that's because um, the, the, the spirit opposes the flesh. And if we're not careful, why I'm burdened for so many believers is because often we can fall into this mindset that uh, greater is my temptation and greater is my fleshly desires than the Spirit of God. And obviously, we know that that is a lie from the devil. Scripture says, uh, greater is he who is in you, the Spirit of God, than he who is in the world. And so God is not this um, mean God who has given us struggles that we can't overcome. When temptation comes, God always provides a way of escape and it's up to us to mortify the lust of the flesh, to put off the old, uh, to abide in Christ, that the, the, the branches that don't bear fruit would be severed away. And I was thinking about it, you know, Colossians chapter 3 is something that I want to encourage you to look at this week in your personal devotion time. But it talks uh, in great detail, Paul kind of unfolds a little bit of the putting off and the putting on, the putting to death, the old self and putting on the new self. And I've talked about this before, I believe, but I, th I always think about muscle atrophy. So if I don't use my right arm, if I, if I go to the gym, but I never lift my right arm and I don't move my right arm and I don't use it at all, I'm rendering the power of my right arm useless. It's still there. Uh, it's still present. It's still attached to my body. And yet it, it doesn't do much good. It doesn't have any strength. And the same is true in our spiritual life. That which you uh, discipline, that which you give attention to, that which you build strength in will be uh, full of strength in your life. And so often we give uh, in to temptation, we give in to the sins of this world, we give in to a complaining spirit, to anger, to gossip, to sexual uh, promiscuity, to all these different places that we can go. And if we're strengthening those things, then undoubtedly they will come out of our lives. And and so the, the life of a believer is constantly working to render the power of sin useless in our lives. My temptations have not gone away. But as I've rendered the power of those sinful activities more and more useless in my life, the less and less I have an appetite for the things of this world, the more I have an appetite for Christ. Obviously, I need to continue to grow in that. And there are things that I'm convicted to put off even this week. And so is it with you. But Paul says we don't focus on the things that are on the earth. We look to the things of the above. So we're putting to death what is earthly in us, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have been made in the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So all of these things, uh, these small sins, these large sins in our mind, uh, they're all changing our thinking, which, as we talked about, leads to our hearts and it comes out of our lives. And that's why we have to strive to, Colossians 3.12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. 
And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. This is the battle of every believer. And while God has given you all that you need to have victory, you have to wake up and consciously fight the battle against the flesh of this world. And I know some of you feel stuck and there's times where I've felt stuck and there's times where um, my life gets busy and some of the things that I did at first, the, some of the things I did when I first learned Christ, memorize scripture, open my Bible, get in those types of settings, those can slowly drift onto the shelf and we begin to look to lesser things and the things of this world creep in. And that's exactly what the enemy tries to do. He aims to seek and kill and destroy. And he aims to get in your mind with things that are lesser than what Christ has. And so I was thinking about, you know, we talked about sanctification. Every believer is in the process of sanctification. It's the, the divine Holy Spirit led process of God creating new affections in our mind that lead to new desires in our heart that produce holy living as we become what we already are. And I was thinking about three ways uh, that, that, that God sanctifies us. And so some of you are experiencing one of these things right now, undoubtedly. Uh, God is sanctifying believers, one, through our devotion. As we submit ourselves to the Lord as we submit ourselves to his word, as we apply his word, he is renewing us and he's shaping us and we're seeking him while he may be found and it's proving profitable in our lives. That's the, that's the best way for God to sanctify us, us submitting to him and doing what he's asked us to do. But the other way is just a part of life. He's sanctifying us through our suffering. So the pain that we're going through, the trials that we go through, all of these are a part of God's sanctification in our lives. That's why you have to have a, a proper view of your suffering because it's making you like Christ. James chapter one says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So these trials and the suffering of this life they're producing steadfastness. So no trials, no steadfastness in your walk with Christ. No testing of your faith, no perseverance of the saints. And so as, as the things of this world let us know that it's broken and that it's not right, that suffering is making us more like Christ. And so you can either trust God in your suffering and take your pain to him and trust that he's making you holy or you can try to suppress your suffering or run to all kinds of things that the world has to offer. And often when life gets hard and when trials come, rather than turning to Christ, which is the way to go when it comes to sanctification, we turn to the things of this world. And that leads to the third way that God sanctifies us. It's through his chastening. Uh, it's through his discipline. Chastening means humbling or, or even squashing. <laughs> and sometimes God has to squash us. And sometimes God has to break us. And sometimes God, because he's holy and because he's gracious, he needs to remind us that we are not God and that our way is not the way. And if he's given us grace, then he loves us enough to chasten us and to discipline us. God is a loving God and discipline is part of his plan for restoring the people that he called into right relationship and right standing with him. I'm thinking of a, a passage in Hebrews. All discipline is is painful for a season, and yet in due time it, it, it proves to be profitable. Um, discipline's not always easy. And and when we're doing the wrong thing, we certainly don't want to be disciplined. But when God chastens us, he shows us, oh, this discipline can produce righteousness in my life, so I need to turn back to the things of the Lord and walk in a manner worthy of my calling. Now, I was thinking just real quick of, of three practical things for you. So, you know, hopefully that's encouraging and just continues to encourage you to fight for righteousness in your walk. But three encouraging things that I think could help you. Replace your secret places of sin with serving others, 
and secret time with the Lord. Replace your secret places of sin with serving others and secret time with the Lord. Why is it that we tend to sin in the secret places whenever we need to meet God in the secret places? Because we assume that nobody's watching. Jeremiah says uh, there are no secret places from God because he's sovereign and he's holy and he's high and he sees all things. And so rather than trying to cover up sin, rather trying to live this double life that we talked about, uh, the best way to render sin useless is to not find yourself in secret places where sin can abound. And the best way to not sin is to serve others, to think of others, uh, to humble yourself and become a servant. And so uh, an idle man is a dangerous man. A bored person is a dangerous person because that's when Satan likes to creep in and cause sin to get into our minds that lead to our heart. And so when you have boredom, when you have idle time, fill it with serving others. Fill it with getting in small groups. Fill it with getting around believers. Fill it with getting around service opportunities and replace the secret places of sin with time in the secret place with God. Time on your knees, time focusing. That leads to the second thing. It's this, replace special God moments with regular God moments. I loved that we closed uh, the service yesterday on our knees together. And some people would say, well, that was a, a really special moment. And I think about that and it's like, the I, what I wanna say to believers is, as believers, we shouldn't need special invitations, special moments to get on our knees and get on our face before God. Every opportunity that we're confronted with the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man is an opportunity to drop to our knees and to focus on the Lord. And so start to think of, of getting on your knees and lying prostrate before God, not as a special moment from time to time, Make it a regular moment in your life. Make it a discipline where in the morning, I'm going to drop to my knees. And when you're on your knees or on your face, it's hard to look at your phone. It's hard to look at the things around you. It's hard to get distracted. You may lay on your face and two minutes, you're still distracted. But as you pray, God will meet you as you look only at him, as you stare into his wonderful face. And I think that's important. Uh, say yes to the Lord. If, if the Spirit puts an inkling in your mind to drop to your knees, it happened to me last week in sermon prep, in my office, uh, confronted with this passage, and I just felt the Spirit say, drop to your knees, and I did. And man, it, it met me. I, I wept before the Lord over my own sin, and I, I, I laid some things down and asked the Lord to help me. And we need to be quick to say yes when the Spirit says drop. Because when we are obedient to the Spirit of God, the Lord meets us and can help us. And so that is the best way to fight your sin, your sin issues that you continue to find yourself in. And then finally, replace excuses with action. You got to replace excuses with action. I don't have time to read my Bible. I get distracted when I pray. I'm not great at praying. I feel a little weird when I get on my knees or on my face. Uh, replace those excuses with action. Uh, the Lord has called us to seek him. The Lord has called us to have devotion to him. The Lord has called us to bring our pain and, and our burdens to his feet. And he's called us to boldly come before his throne, asking anything. And so certainly we can ask him to help us with our sins. Certainly we can help him, ask him to help us render the power of sin useless in our lives. And so I just wanted you to know that I, I have so many more thoughts about this and I'd love to even have conversations with some of you and am. Uh, thank you for sending, you know, moments of, of encouragement, things that the Lord's doing in your life and your heart. Uh, attached to this email is, is a great testimony of someone in our church who, who sent me their testimony, said we could share it. And it's just them striving to live a walk that is worthy of their calling. And, and it describes the battle that we all face, even in small, minute ways uh, that try to pull us away from the things of the Lord. And then secondly, there's attached a worksheet, um, a put off, put on worksheet. It, sh worksheet. It's by our friends at Life Action Ministries, actually. But it just kind of 
consolidates all the things that scripture say says about what you should put off and what you should put on. And I couldn't encourage you enough to use this in your personal quiet time in the secret place with the Lord over the next week or so. And, you know, circle the things that you need to put off and read the scriptures that go with the things that you need to put on and begin to ask the Lord specifically to reveal these things, to sever these put off things from your life and to begin to grow uh, the fruitful um, goodness of following Christ in your life as you submit to him and his word. I'm praying for you. I'm hopeful that there can be victory for every believer who is struggling to put off the old and put on the new. We have to submit to Christ together. Thanks for listening. Hope these uh, couple things encourage you. You are loved.